We long for what is denied us. Away from here, the world is filled with a thousand, thousand diversities. I long for life, for time and freedom, to be surrounded by careless and idle chatter. I long to draw that life, to live and rest, wake up next to a woman's beauty every day, to see it in her lines and forms and the colours dwelling within her, growing out of her, flying through her mind like a... At school, I had a friend who was a bird. Eric Kennington was a bird Sitting on a branch In a tailored suit and hair style from France Effortlessly sketching likenesses His pencil gauging space and tone and distances As if every morning Set my imagination flying with every inside over her. Step in the darkness, a stab of pain in my side, feeling like a broken dog. A little piece of me has come loose, a little bone island, a dislocated ninth rib, a falling apart. From the white walls and quiet of my dream, I can hear the noise outside in the distance, the mad nightmare of Passchendaele. My fellows shouting in the chaos, trying to hear anything above the barrage of four million shells and the thunder of rain. 
Later, I would hear about the bodies torn and broken, sinking in the quagmire, abstraction, bits of tissue and mud, blood and ash consuming each other. And somewhere in the midst of the screams, the trivial pain in my side, the guilt, the loss, I feel a sharp scratching on my retina, or at the back, behind my eye, deeper, to allow a faint pulsing glow of pinky orange from the yolk within. Blood vessel hairlines more delicate and diffuse than any Renaissance hand could have drawn. How could this delicate perfection exist in the same world as a 140 ton howitzer, firing thousand kilogram shells that propel hot metal shrapnel into soft human tissue, into minds protected by perfectly proportioned frangible shells? Where is the insanity in the war, in nature, in the place in my mind where these two things touch? There are avocets and oyster catchers, and fire crests and chip chaps in the hedgerows. Soon it will happen again. Even here in the marshes around Rye Harbour, the unlikeliest of places, I know it's waiting for me. You don't seem to be bothered by your memories of it all, Claude. How have you managed that? You had a much rougher time than me. Well, you know, I was invalided out. It's a shell shock? It's a kind of sensory overload. And somewhere in there, my mind just fused mm -hmm. and blacked. I have no particular memories of my time convalescing, really. It was quiet. I slept, walked around a bit. Some people came and went. It's all that diffuse. So by the time I came home, it was as if I was looking at my time in the war through a filter. Almost like it all happened to somebody else. So, it was a blessing? I don't know about that. And God knows what other bits and pieces of my mind have gone missing in the process. Soon. Soon. It discolors my world its dull inevitability. We walk on across the minefield. Do you feel angry? Not me. Do you? Well, sometimes. Me. Mm. I only think about it occasionally. Just occasionally I and I awake at night and think, wasn't it all extraordinary? We've had to protect one another, share our sleep and food. We've seen thousands of dead and dying. We've had romping good times and horrid bad ones together. But we have been alive. We've, we have lived through vital times. We have created history. It's almost time. This awareness of the fragility of life, the randomness, the unfairness, the sniper's alley of life, the death. This is the indelible, irreducible, inoperable mark that the war has left on you. Making apparent the dreadful gesture of its shadow falling, a black king casually taking a white pawn. But now we must start a new life. It's coming. And hope we have lived through it all for a good purpose. Now. His name was Billy. We talked the previous night, 
trying to keep warm, trying to keep our minds distracted. He wasn't a soldier. He was just a young lad who not taken to school, wanted an adventure in a grown-up world. He asked me to help him write his letter home. I was happy to help him. This is what he said. My dear beloved parents, I'm writing as I'm very solemn and done in from the digging and the smell and horror of it. All around is turmoil and confusion and the wickedness and wrath of man. And he stopped. And he asked me to start again, not wanting to worry his parents. My dear Ma, I am well and cheery. Please tell Danny I'm sorry for running away before we finish the Norton. Tell him there's a sergeant here who rides a Norton and told me never to blast clean the crankcase because you get dirt in the internal pipes. The only way is to use an extra long twist drill bit to turn it by hand through the oil ways. I bet that's what the trouble was. Tell Daddy I'll be home to finish the Norton with him soon. Tell him I'm sorry. Please forgive me, your loving son. His name was Billy. He wasn't a soldier, he was just a young lad. At war and in peace, life was a sniper's alley. For Claude, there was a causal series of steps toward the bullet. He smoked. He had a history of heart trouble following an episode of rheumatic fever as a young man. He was gassed and eaten. He was overweight. But he'd survived the war. He was only 31 and he fell ill suddenly. He died following a surgical operation for obstruction of the bowel the previous day. It could just as well have been a bullet from a sniper. It was sudden and shocking and unfair. And I was as angry as I've ever been. Incoherently angry. Simply didn't understand what was happening. This was my last dream At least the last dream I remember After this they worked themselves out on canvas Fragments of doorways and marks in the landscape The memory of finding my father on the floor And assuming he was dead in my head between us falls away as my dream takes me down a final desolate passageway my father had fallen he recovered but in that moment he was Billy, Claude and all of them and I blacked out I had to escape I had to think. If you strip away the accumulated fiction of the war, the grand themes, the mud and the limbs and the jolly old rain, the constructs and stories that constitute an official history, what is left? In war, one lives on the desperate edge of now. War reveals that essential present tense creature at the centre of oneself. Once it has been illuminated, even in the most failing of light, you can't unsee it. That is the only subject worthy of this oil and ink and blood. To reach that essential pulsing life, one must excavate deep into the paper and the canvas. Peel away the layers. Strip away the nerves and the synapses and senses. Cut away the skin and these paper thin defences. Underneath the sun is the father. And defined by him and in opposition to him. I've tried to make judicious changes. Cut down the anger and the patience. And tried to wash and cut through his pages. Swimming against his genes. Influence in my bloodstream. Here away the layers, push away the duty and the cargoes and pretenses. Beneath the sand, 
legs and the barbed wire fences. Underneath the soldier with the stripes is the band. Fragile and naked, profane and sacred, looking at the life around him, wasted with love and hatred, wearing down just like the rest. With fears and doubts and rest. Nature is a dynamic, constantly changing, fluxing, complex chaos. There are only leaves blown about by those forces, a minor component, an infestation, a virus. When I'm not here, when I'm out there in the conscious world, I realize that so long as there are two people remaining on this world, there will be war. So what can I do? Art is an empathy machine. 
Art allows one to look through a fellow human's eyes. That's all I can do. That is our only hope. I will bring back words and bitter truths to those that want the war to carry on forever. I hope my ochres and umbers and oxides will burn their bitter souls. You're cured, Mr. Nash. You can wake up now. But it's beautiful here. It's perfect. And it will always be here. But for now, it's time to wake up. Thank you very much. And thanks for having us. And thank you for having us.